in Lesson 6 talking about Mary, our mother and advocate. We're going to be talking about the Blessed Virgin Mary, and there's uh, perhaps no, no other doctrine that's so misunderstood among non-Catholics as the teachings about Mary, and then the papacy, which we're going to be studying in our next lesson. This is a, a lesson that if we get a hold of the truths here, it expands our concept of the kingdom of God and gives us a, gives us a mother to pray for us and intercede for us. When looking at the kingdom of God, we see that the kingdom of God is not a courtroom, but the kingdom of God is a family room. And in a family room, we have a father, we have an older brother in our Lord Jesus Christ. We have older brothers and sisters, and the saints, we have a meal, and we have a mother given to us at the cross. When Jesus was on the cross, he gave his mother to John, and what happens at the cross is universally understood as happening to the whole church. I want to talk just for a moment about the words for worship and the words for venerate because we certainly venerate Mary. We give her a special uh, veneration, but we don't worship her. The word for worship is the word latria, L-A-T-R-I-A, latria. Latria in classical theology is the word that describes the worship and the homage due only to an uncreated being. And there's only one uncreated being, and that is God himself. And so we can only worship God. Now, in the English language, particularly in, uh, in Great Britain, the word worship can take on different meaning. But here, when we talk about worship in, in America, we're talking about literally worshiping as you would worship God. We don't worship Mary. We do venerate her. Veneration, known as dulia, D-U-L-I-A, dulia in classical theology, is the honor due to the excellence of a created being. So we can venerate a created being and give them honor, like the saints. Now there's special veneration given to Mary, and that is called hyperdulia. Hyperdulia is the special uh, veneration that we give to the Blessed Virgin Mary. We worship and adore God alone, and we venerate the saints with exceptional veneration to our Blessed Mother. Now, we venerate people in our lives every day. When you go home and you see pictures of your family on the wall, you didn't put those pictures on the wall to help you remember the fact that you have a mother and father, and you think there's a chance that I might forget, and this is simply going to remind me. No, you put those pictures there because you honor them, and there's something special about them. They're family members, and that is dulia. We're venerating. We're honoring our loved ones and our children. And hyperdulia is something that we give to Mary, our mother. So in the Old Testament, there's clearly lots of scriptures that speak of the Queen Mother. This is a part of Jewish history, and it's a part of our history. Now as we transition to the New Testament, we see that Mary takes on a special role, and others recognize it like Elizabeth. It is important to grasp that those mentioned in the New Testament understood the rich tradition, the rich background of the Queen Mother in Israel's history. So everybody who comes to understand Jesus and knows salvation history, the idea that Jesus' mother would have a very special role would not be, and I repeat, would not be a foreign concept. It simply wouldn't be a foreign concept at all. So we turn to the New Testament into uh, Luke's Gospel, chapter 1, starting in verse 39. In those days Mary arose and went with haste into the hill country to a city of Judah, which uh, we know today as the city of Ein Kerem, which if you go to Israel with us, we'll be visiting there. And went to the, to the city of Judah, and she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. And when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the babe leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit, and she exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why is this granted me that the mother, Gevera, the mother of my Lord, should come to me? For behold, when the voice of your greeting came to my ears, the babe in my womb leaped for joy, 
And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. And Mary said, and then she goes into the Magnificat. She reads the magni the, She goes into the Magnificat. She doesn't read it. She says it. <laughs> she gets her prayer book out and reads it. <laughs> my soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. That's an important verse right there, God, my Savior, verse 47, because oftentimes when you speak to your Protestant brothers and sisters about Mary, they'll point to that verse and say, see, she needed a, a Savior. She needed a Savior. She called Jesus her Savior, and our answer is, absolutely, he was her Savior. But the graces of the cross outside of time were applied to her life when she was conceived, and she was conceived without sin as a singular work of God demonstrating his grace and preparing the new Ark of the Covenant for the Messiah. 